Hi guys, I hope you had a good afternoon tea. We've got a really awesome session for you coming up now. Uh, we've got Graham Cross. Graham describes himself as half scientist, half engineer, and he's been using Python since 1.2. Who else has been using Python since 1.2? Anyone? There we go. Yeah, it's a bit rare these days. All right, guys, um, let's give it up for Graham. So this talk is about how to do Python on the cheap in embedded hardware, particularly about MicroPython and how low you can push it. So MicroPython done dirt cheap, or how low can we really go? And firstly, I want to start off with a note that I am going to talk about a lot of limitations, but this is not in any way, shape or form criticism. What you're going to see, what people have done to cram Python into tiny little spaces is just amazing. It is some of the most interesting and exciting work I've seen in Python in a while, certainly in the embedded space. Um, and there's lots and lots of tough decisions when you take a language that was never designed for the embedded space and cram it down into tiny little places. So no black hats in this talk. I want to be really clear. It is all about golden crowns to the team because um, watching what they have done, and I should state I have no affiliation with the project. I'm not the author, not part of the core team, just a user. What they have done is amazing. And also a disclaimer, I said $7, I want to be clear, $7 US. Um, <laughs> what I could have bought for $7 US was about $7 Australian when, you know, a year ago, when I submitted the abstract, it was probably about $8. If you look back on these slides in a year's time, probably more like $14, $20 Australian. <laughs> so let's not dwell on that. Um, let's jump back to 1949. If you've been to the basement of Melbourne Museum, you will have seen this. This is CIRAC. This is, depending on how you count it, the fourth or fifth electronic computer built in the world, the first one in Australia. It's the only remaining first generation computer in the world. 1949 until 1964, um, those of you from the Bureau of Meteorology, you should know that the first computer modelled weather predictions in Australia on this computer. Um, before the upgrade, 500 hertz, they clocked it up to a kilohertz. 2,000 bytes of, of RAM, two and a half tonne, 30 kilowatts of power. I reckon Melbourne probably dimmed every time they switched it on. But this, this was the state of computing. And if you're ever in Melbourne and you're doing a bit of a geek tour of Melbourne, drop down to the basement. It's free to go down there and have a look. And it is really impressive. Let's jump to 65. Um, the journal Electronics published a paper by the R&D director at Fairchild Semiconductor, highly controversial paper for its time. He went back in 75 to revise what he had um, claimed, and even today we still talk about Moore's Law, and what he was talking about at that time in terms of the doubling of capacity every year, and then he said every two years, has proven to be a reasonably good Thumb. Certainly when you look at predictions of computing back in 65, there's not many that have stood the test of time like this. So the Intel 4004 in 1971 had 2,300 transistors or so. By the mid-90s with Pentium, we were up to around 3 million transistors. Your typical Core i5 in, say, a Broadwell architecture, you're talking roughly 2 billion transistors. Um, so we've seen that climb, but if you have a look at the cost of an integrated circuit transistor, so a single transistor, in 65, Moore was looking at about $30 US in today's dollars. Today, it's about a nano dollar. We've dropped from, you know, up in the micron fabs down into 100 nano fabs, down to about 20 nanometer fab. Um, IBM, I think, are down exploring commercial seven nanometer. It's really impressive. Um, the interesting thing for me is not how many transistors we've packed onto large computers, it's what's happened to microcontrollers. Because if we jump 40 years to today, we've seen processing power climb, we've seen core count climb, I.O. options, RAM, storage options, storage capacity, at the same time that power consumption has dropped dramatically, price has dropped astronomically as you've seen, and the footprint of what you can do has also dropped. And so if you're, a, if you're a hacker, a maker, 
if you're a, an engineer designing commercial products, you now have a wealth of choice in the microcontroller market. So we have things today like the Raspberry Pi, the BeagleBone Black, the Arduino, the Teensy, the Pi Board, um, what was called the Spark Core but is now the Particle Core for legal reasons, the chip which claims to be the first $9 Linux computer and is currently going through Kickstarter or Indiegogo. There are lots and lots of options. And you have options not just in where you buy it from, but is it just running bare metal? Single application running no operating system. Is it a real-time operating system? Does it have Linux or some other operating system? Onboard networking? Um, what sort of CPU family? You know, are you dealing with uh, an Atmega CPU? Is it Intel? Is it ARM? What sort of ARM is it? Um, does it have graphics on board? What sort of I.O.? Um, you know, GPIO, analog, CAN, I2C, SPI. Um, does it have expansion options? If so, what sort of expansion options? Can you plug an Arduino shield into it, for example? If I'm in high school and I want to actually fire up my Raspberry Pi and do something interesting with it, how hard is it to actually hook some LEDs in and make them blink? Or switch an, um, plug a relay in so I can switch on and off my home brewing system that my parents don't know I have yet. Um, and I could keep on going, but there's also, apart from what you actually see up there in terms of a board, there are some other things to consider, like what are the development tools like? What sort of programming languages are available? If I choose a certain board, am I forced to use a certain language? In the old days, it was all assembler, then you know, C, C++, Forth, some other options. Interpreters really didn't tend to run on systems like this. What's the community like? What sort of support can I get? What's the documentation like? If I'm going to buy these and actually commercialize this, am I dealing with a single source supplier? What happens if that supplier obsoletes this board or components on the board? Am I stuck? Um, can I buy commercial volumes? What do the supply agreements look like? Is the design open source? Am I actually able to take this design and modify it myself if I want? And so it brings us to what I'd say is the prototyping sweet spot. And you may not be able to see this, all of the points in this, but there's really four key parts to this Venn diagram. The cost of goods, the ease of use, the performance, and all of the interfacing options. And between those, for most of the work that I do in the biomedical space, um, they're the ones that are the most interest. So somewhere in all of that, is, there lies an answer, and the answer for me is going to be different to the answer to you, depending on what sort of product you're trying to develop or what sort of problem you're trying to solve. So it brings us to why consider Python on a micro. It's easy to learn and it's easy to teach, certainly compared to languages like C, C++. Um, if I'm trying to teach an engineer how to use Python um, to control a robot or something like that, or I'm trying to teach a high school student how to blink LEDs, I don't want to have to be teaching them about pointers and you know, manual memory um, allocation and release, for example. It has the REPL, so I can just fire up a prompt and I can interactively type away an experiment. I don't have to go through that compile cycle, so I have a much faster development time. If I've got engineers who already know how to use Python on a PC, because they've been doing data crunching or they've been um, automating test scripts to drive robots or query some sort of analyzer, then being able to transfer that knowledge down into micros really helps. It has a good standard library when it's available on the micro. We'll come back to that. Excellent ecosystem and a really fantastic community. It's not all rosy though. Performance, um, most of the time, is significantly slower than your assembler or your C, C++ options. Your memory footprint is always going to be larger than those options as well. And you do have to worry about garbage collection. And if you're really concerned about a high performance real time target, whether that's going to work for you. So 2013, there was a Kickstarter campaign for MicroPython and the Pi board. The intention was to port Python 3 down onto a microcontroller called the Pi board. Um, and what we've got today is Python 3.4 implemented not just for the Pi board, 
but for a range of hardware platforms. A memory footprint of 75 to 260 kilobytes at the moment. It can run in 8K of RAM. Um, it has the ability to work with just standard Python. Uh, there's a range of what they call emitter detectors, uh, direct decorators, got that out, um, which allow you to do things like embed uh, assembler into your Python code if you want to. It has good documentation, it's got a really active community, and it's alive and kicking with plenty of opportunities to contribute back into it. I mentioned libraries earlier. One of the things to be aware of is that MicroPython doesn't come with a normal um, Python standard library. The batteries are not really all included. Um, there is a MicroPython lib, which is on PyPy. You can use pip to bring across the parts of the library you want so that you're not using up what is a precious commodity in embedded environments, storage space. Um, it is a non-monolithic standard library. The library also isn't bytecode compatible with CPython. You can't just pull a PYC file off of your PC and drop it into a MicroPython environment and expect it to work. Um, it does come with some MicroPython and board support packages. Um, and people are working on what they call UPIP, which is a MicroPython specific version of PIP that you can host on your MicroPython system to actually install packages directly if you've got user writable storage. And that's one of the catches that I want to mention is that if your hardware target doesn't have some form of user storable um, user writable storage, so it doesn't have um, writable flash, it doesn't have a USB mass storage device or SD card, then you have to build the libraries into the firmware before you install the firmware. And so you're back to the old days of compiling C, C++ code and bundling in some Python, which really hurts your rapid prototyping turnaround. While we're talking about libraries and limitations, let's talk about some broader ones. Um, I've mentioned that it's not 100% compatible with C, Python in terms of bytecode, but just in terms of the language itself, there are some limitations and some deliberate decisions where it is different. And most of them wouldn't bite the average engineer who is just wanting to do fairly standard Python. But if they're wanting to do something in terms of multiple inheritance with class structures, they may find themselves getting caught. And there's a number of those, and I've put up there the URL um, for the wiki, which has a really good list of all of the known differences, limitations, and bugs, and what's happening with them. Um, it's a subset of the object model, um, so if you're doing funny things with new and Dell, for example, you may get caught out. It's worth reading the documentation. There's only a subset of the introspection features. Um, and Unicode, if you were at Nick's talk and thought that Unicode was a work in progress generally in Python 3, even more so in MicroPython. Um, if you're trying to code in Kanji on a MicroPython board, you have your work cut out for you at the moment. I mentioned the Pi board. There's a range of ports now available in differing stages of maturity. Um, if you, I just want to talk about the Pi board briefly because that's where it began. Um, it's an STM32 CPU. It's running at 168 megahertz on a Cortex M4, 192K of RAM, a megabyte of ROM, and you can happily run Python on that. It's got 29 GPIO pins, 3 ADC, 2 DAC, 4 LEDs, it's got two switches, it's got a three axis accelerometer. Real-time clock, micro SD, you can mount it through a micro USB port um, to do mass storage. It's got DFU for really easy firmware uploading. Um, it can support what they call skins, which are the expansion boards for the Pi board for things like uh, touch LCD and, and other expansion options. But it doesn't have any inbuilt Wi-Fi. That's one catch. Also, it's $45 US. Um, that's one off price through Adafruit. So you're talking about something that is quite a bit more expensive than a basic Raspberry Pi, perhaps not a lot more expensive, but it is definitely more expensive than a Raspberry Pi, but it's also quite a bit smaller and it's simpler if you just want to get a Python system up and running in embedded land. There's then a number of others that I've got listed up there, things like the Teensy. Um, I think it's only Teensy 3.1, there's a family of them. Um, you, there's a limited version for 16-bit PIC, um, some of the TI and other STM systems. 
There is a port to what they call bear arm for people that want to um, port this to new ARM systems. There's a version for Unix for people that want to experiment just on their standard Linux box, for example. And what the rest of this talk is about, which is the ESP8266. This is a really low-cost Wi-Fi system on chip board. Um, I'm not going to dwell on all of the fine points. What I did was I put that up there, not expecting you to read it, but just to be aware that this isn't just a system that can turn on and off a single LED. Um, it's got Wi-Fi capabilities. It's um, only got 64K of RAM. It's only got an 80 megahertz clock um, running on a RISC CPU. But again, it's still enough to run MicroPython. Um, the fact that it's got inbuilt Wi-Fi there is really quite impressive. Um, 300 meter range with the, um, you might be able to see the little antenna printed onto the board there. We're talking postage size, 300 meter Wi-Fi range. If you connect an antenna, you can get about four kilometers, I've been told. I haven't tried that. Um, you can use it, and it was originally really designed as a Wi-Fi module that you just talked to via the UART if you had another microcontroller system and wanted smart Wi-Fi. So you'd hook this up to your Raspberry Pi or your Arduino system. But when Espress, the manufacturers, released their SDK, it allowed people to start actually using it as its own standalone microcontroller. And that's where the fun began. So if you hop on eBay, um, any of those sorts of sites, you can pick these up um, for well under $3 US, one off. Um, to use this sort, you need to plug in your own FTDI USB adapter. It doesn't come with USB inbuilt, but that's all you really need to get up and running. Um, there's a range of these. Um, for example, AI thinkers do the ESP01 up to the ESP12. Um, I've got a 12 here if you want to have a look. That's this little beast here. Um, and then there is the Node MCU. And the nice thing about the Node MCU, which is the one here plugged into the USB connection, is it gives you everything you need to talk to a computer, fire up um, the interpreter, and play with it. It's basically a complete hardware package with pins soldered on, ready to plug into a breadboard and start prototyping. Uh, $12.95, so that is definitely more than the US $7, but that is for a complete system versus the $2.95 one. Um, it doesn't have as much I.O. as the uh, Pi board. It comes with a Lua interpreter. If you're not familiar with Lua, it's um, Brazilian um, interpreted scripting language, quite similar to Python. Um, it's very small, very well suited to embedded applications. It has an inbuilt networking library, and so you can do a lot with it out of the box. Um, the Arduino IDE supports this system if you want to program in C, C++ on it, and MicroPython's been ported to it. If you couldn't see when I held it up, that should hopefully give you an idea on sizes. Um, that's a dollar coin there, and um, gives you a bit of a feel for what we're talking about. These are small, small systems with extremely low power consumption, but with Wi-Fi on board and enough I.O. to actually do meaningful things uh, so if you're, for example, working in the connected health space and you want to have a point of care analyzer that can process blood strips, um, take the reading, transmit it wirelessly, and last a full day on the battery, systems like this are really interesting to prototype, which is why at Planet Innovation we've been exploring a range of embedded platforms like this to find that sweet spot between cost, size, power consumption, interface flexibility, but also prototyping capabilities, as well as final development and commercialization capabilities. If you're into the Internet of Things, these open up all sorts of options. You know, when we're talking little postage size devices with wireless built in, the options for where you can embed those um, are either really exciting or really scary, depending on your perspective. <laughs> So the Node MCU and MicroPython, at the very end of this talk, I've got a link to these slides with a set of resources. Um, so please don't feel like you need to copy all this down. There's a lot of information that I've left out of this and just kept in the resources. But if you want to do anything useful with this board, you're not just firing it up with Python. You actually need the full development tool chain, so GCC and all of the, the build tools that go with it. Um, and that's 
GCC explicitly for the ESP8266. Um, you need a firmware install tool and there's some um, good ones out there. There's one that's Python based using PySerial that works really well. And you need to have strong Google Foo. You need to read document source code, spec sheets and circuit diagrams. And that's certainly one thing where we're planning to do um, to contribute back is to improve the documentation around this as well as some patches for issues we found to help just build up this ecosystem and make it a bit more usable. Um, there's a little command there for how you build firmware and it's got one command line part to it, one argument which is not documented anywhere I found before I bricked my um, Node MCU. And when I sat down and just read lots of source code and finally found the magic little word that made me go, huh, what's that for? And started digging back and then started Googling knowing what word I was meant to be looking for, I discovered that there was a very good reason why I'd bricked my Node MCU. It now works. Life's good. Um, um, it's the, you know, it's the DIO, the flash mode DIO part. And that's one of the problems with this board, which I'll come to, is... Just because you bought it doesn't mean that if you go out and buy it, we've got the same hardware configuration. It does seem to vary a little bit, and sometimes in subtle ways that mean you can um, render them inoperable. Yeah. Fun for the whole family. Uh, so some limitations around the ESP system. Um, on the ESP, you've got no mountable flash system. So when you fire it up, you do work, you disconnect the power, it's all gone. If you want to have a startup script, your own libraries, things like that, you need to build them into the firmware, which is why you need the full toolchain. Uh, it's a really bare bones Wi Fi implementation. Um, you can scan for access points, you can connect to an access point with a password up to WPA2. Anything more fancy than that, you're, you're out of luck. Minimal standard library support at the moment. Um, and documentation is pretty limited as well. There's no floating point. Um, and that, in summary, for as far as the ESP8266, we've kind of pushed it to a point where we do really now know how low we can go. We can do some basic work with it, but if we want engineers to just pick up a board and start playing, the options are that they can use this and it will kind of work in frustrating ways. Or they could just stick with what was on there with the Lua interface and have definitely more capabilities than they have today with it. So it's good in terms of it's really easy to be prototyping. All of the hardware, all of the firmware is completely open source. Most of the tool chain is, not all of it. Um, and it's dirt cheap. Um, but there are some varying hardware configurations and MicroPython today is just a little bit too limited on this particular family of CPUs. I'm running over. I might come back to the demo at the end. It's basically just fire up a REPL and show you that, yes, you really can run Python on it. I just want to make a couple of points. Um, this board has lots of potential. MicroPython in general has an awful lot of potential. Um, if you really, really need to use a low, low, low-cost microcontroller with Python today, it's worth considering as long as you understand the drawbacks. Um, there are some other boards in between the Pi board and the ESP8266 um, family, such as the Discovery board I've listed there. It's $19, it's more powerful, it's got onboard storage, it doesn't have Wi-Fi. So again, we're back to really understanding what your needs are. Um, and the Pi board, it's good, it's expensive relative to these. So where is the sweet spot? You really need to think about cost, usability, speed, form factor, boot time, networking, I.O., to understand what you really need. If you really want a Python-specific embedded solution that is got, you know, instant boot time, no operating system complicating things, it just runs a single Python app for you, the Pi board is well worth looking at. The additional cost of the hardware is probably well and truly um, outweighed by the development time you would waste trying to get MicroPython up and running to the same point on an ESP8266. If you want a flexible all singing, all dancing option, Raspberry Pi, I think, is still the way to go today. As long as you understand 40 second boot time, give or take, they have to learn Linux, they have to figure out how to write an init script to get their app up and running, all of those 
issues. Um, lowest cost, hacking challenge, ESP8266 is definitely the way to go today. So the good thing is, I can't tell you what the solution is for you, but there are plenty of solutions out there today, and this space just continues to get more and more exciting. If you look at where we were two years ago, MicroPython really did not exist. A year ago, it was running on the Pi board. Today, it's running on a whole stack of boards. And for me, that is really exciting. So if you want to actually pick this up and run with it, here are some resources. Um, I've listed the resources for MicroPython, the forum for ESP8266, which is full of information, quick start guide, including the Adafruit tutorial, which is really, really useful, um, and also some information on Node MCU. It comes out of China. It's fully open sourced, both at hardware and firmware levels. Um, they have actually done a really good job of trying to make this a platform to, to hack away on. Um, lastly, if you want these slides, um, that's the URL and a QR code to grab it. Otherwise, I'm here until Tuesday afternoon. Come and grab me. Um, thank you.